Great. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, so, uh, as uh, Julia said, you know, we've um, the lowest project as kind of we announced ourselves for Worlds through WorldCom a couple of years ago uh, at, uh, when it was uh, quite a lot smaller in Munich, and I'm really pleased to be back again talking to you about the progress we've made since then. Um, it's also really helpful to you know, follow on from a previous talk where I think um, a lot of our strategies are we're trying to address some of the challenges that were addressed uh, that were um, suggested and it'd be interesting to have feedback from you about how we're going about things. So first of all, for, I'll just very briefly go over the lowest background um, as many of you will be familiar with what we're doing. Uh, we're set up as a not-for-profit open project um, aiming to produce, um, well, our, our current focus and our current goal is to produce a open source system on chip implementing a RISC-V instructor architecture that runs Linux well. And we talk about being the, um, the kind of Linux of the hardware world um, in that we want to provide a platform that other people can build on, a complete system on chip that you can take and customize uh, for your own designs so that you can uh, if you have an, a particular accelerator you want to implement or a particular idea for um, you know, optimizing a branch predictor or execution of dynamic language runtimes, you have a, a starting point from which to build upon. Uh, so the whole point, and I think it's worth emphasizing that in terms of being the Linux of the hardware world, it's not just about the code, but also the kind of, we want to achieve the same you know, transformational effect that um, open source development has had on a software world, but for the hardware world. Um, but of course, there are lots of challenges, as we've just discussed, about um, exactly how those models map to hardware, where there are very real differences. Uh, now, the project itself actually follows on from our experience with the Raspberry Pi project. Um, so my PhD supervisor at the time was one of the co-founders of Raspberry Pi. So about four and a half years ago now, was about the time, it's just about four and a half years ago was when we had uh, the initial uh, development boards uh, uh, arrive, about half a dozen or so. Um, I got involved at that point, started fixing a few issues on the software stack, and, and people kept asking me to fix more, and it kind of grew from there. And that gave us a real perspective on the power of a community, what a community can achieve uh, in terms of uh, producing uh, both what the community can achieve, but also the value of having something real. In the, with Raspberry Pi, we identified that what would be what we felt would be useful would be to have a real um, low-cost development board and then uh, the strategy was to go out and produce said development board as opposed to um, kind of standing at the sidelines and trying to encourage other people to do that and we're kind of taking on that same kind of strategy of low risk where um, our approach is to build something that's interesting but also to make it real to tape out real silicon and ship development boards that feature it. And currently, the core team is based at the computer lab in Cambridge. Um, now, I suppose just to take a little bit of a step back for how I think about the motivations for a project like this, and I should say that this is, um, you know, individuals who contribute or collaborate with low risk have their own set of motivations. Even the, you know, each of the, the core team members all have different motivations, even the, you know, the founders of a project. But I think um, a number of us perhaps share some of these. Uh, I think a key one is security and privacy, um, where although it's not a, a, a complete solution to that problem, um, we have a situation where we rely and depend upon complex computing systems to run our everyday lives, but it's difficult to really trust these systems as there's little ability to audit um, the implementation of hardware controls to really understand how that system works in the same way that we do with software. And of course, we have open source software and things are actually still pretty horrible with security and privacy there. So it's not a golden bullet, but um, I think it also offers up new opportunities for investigating uh, modifications at the hardware level to try and ameliorate common security attacks, which perhaps um, there's, which I think uh, if we have uh, more people attempting to create new hardware products who are trying to innovate, then we'll see more innovative solutions to these kind of issues. And with low risk, we have our own, um, you know, we're very interested in tag memory as a way of providing fine-grained memory protection. I think there's a, clearly some of you here will feel that, um, you know, openness has, uh, there's a real moral argument about things being open in the sense that, I mean, if you, 
consider that uh, computers and computing in general is a way of you know, amplifying human ability and allowing us to, as humanity to achieve more. Um, you know, the major problems that we face as well as admittedly the most trivial ones are solved with complex computing systems or, um, or I suppose the collections of very simple computing systems with embedded devices and IoT all the way up to um, high performance computing. And you have to wonder whether it's, um, you know, is, is it right that access to developing uh, novel solutions to these kind of problems is limited to um, a very few, peop a very few people? Um, wouldn't we move forward faster and better as uh, humanity if we had more access to these kind of tools? Which kind of leads towards the argument of pragmatics, where, you know, as has been proven again and again in the software world, um, open source is a good counter agent to um, the complexity of handling large uh, distributed, of, well, very large uh, complex projects in the sense that um, through a shared investment in the underlying technology, um, that means that you c people can put in enough effort to get things working, say on the core SOC, but then as I mentioned before, uh, put more and more focus on the things that actually differentiate you from other uh, for, from, from your competitors or produce the, uh, the, the new technology that you actually want to deliver. So our approach, as I say, is to produce a low-cost development board. Um, we hope that this won't just be a one-time one effort. Um, I think, so there was some discussion previously about the, you know, the economics of semiconductor manufacture, the p possibility of having um, much lower cost uh, but you know, reducing barriers of entry in terms of um, lower minimum wafer orders and things of that nature. And I think low risk is structured so that obviously we would welcome all of these te technological developments. We'd, you know, we would benefit massively, but at the same time, we're not predicated on these things. We're looking at what we can do to work with you know, the world that we have now. Um, and so part of that is you know, trying to collect community effort, community IP, produce, provide a path for people to get there designs, shipping in hardware, um, but also looking at whether there are ways that we can change um, the way that we uh, design our chips in order to uh, appeal to larger sections of the open source community, perhaps moving more of a hardware design through to um, software configurability. And that's kind of the idea behind Minion cores, where we have a, a small number of microcontroller class cores close to I.O. to implement initially implement low-speed I.O. that we're interested in exploring other potential uses. And so this both capitalizes on the fact that there are many more software developers in the world than there are hardware developers, but also gives the flexibility for people to try and customize the solution after it's been taped out. And we know that this is, speaking to many of our friends in industry, it's actually quite, it is a, it is a common practice. There's been you know, many documented instances of this over, over the decades, um, but it's, it's often something that's hidden to the end user, as with many other aspects of a system on chip, where you may have reasonably good documentation for the main application core, but um, all the periphery around that is mostly undocumented, or if it is only available through NDA to a very limited set of people. And key to our approach is really to form collaborations, uh, to work with others in the community who are producing uh, projects and work, you know, as I suppose a Linux distribution does, to collect in different bits of IP from other people, um, to build on those. Um, it's something where we can't do it alone. We're a small team, um, but we're trying to, you know, find ways to, uh, you know, deliver um, to get the maximum benefit that we can out of the opportunity we have to produce a real shipping SOC. And so the other aspect, um, the technical aspect that we're pursuing is tagged memory, which is something we're interested in as a security feature, but also for um, performance monitoring, potentially synchronization. Um, and so the, the, I won't go into detail there as we've talked about it at um, previous conferences quite a few times now. Um, the idea is to provide a, a, a lightweight, low cost way of offering fine grained uh, memory protection such that each location in memory is augmented with um, a small amount of extra metadata that you might lose for fine-grained read-write bits, for instance. So our progress to date, um, and so about, as I said, about two years ago, we announced a project to World at Orconf. Um, this was a very nerve-wracking thing for us, even though Orconf was substantially smaller then than it is now. 
Um, we'd kind of got together that previous summer. We'd, uh, you know, we had the initial, we had, we had the offer of initial funding. You know, we knew what we wanted to do, which was to do something to uh, push forward open source hardware. And we'd had a lot of brainstorming about how we might do that. We generated the initial ideas. We'd uh, evaluated potential um, ISAs. So we looked at OpenRISC, Spark V8, Risk V, you know, out of patent ISAs and the like. And so going to AllConf, we were obviously also a little bit worried that we might annoy everybody who were. <laughs> uh, but but it, it was actually an out, uh, talking about our work early was one of the best decisions we made, and it really kind of hammered home a point about you know the power of being open with your ideas, and that we formed you know valuable collaborations then that are continuing you know through till now. Uh, we met the pulp folks who were working to integrate their um, their pulp cores as part of our minion core cluster. And we've just had you know, a, an endless supply of um, useful ideas and, uh, and other contributions. Um, so since then, we have had a series. We've been kind of slowly growing the team at the computer lab in Cambridge. And we've had a series of milestones. Um, all of our all of our day-to-day -day development is public on GitHub. But every now and again, we like to kind of put a put a uh, put a tag, make a formal release, and try and put some documentation up there as well so that people can uh, download it and run it on the FPGA board of their choice. So we've had a, the initial release, we've int which added tagged memory to UC Berkeley's um, Rocket Core, a uh, later release that added, that uh, untethered that core, so we removed the re reliance on a separate ARM core for handling I.O. And most recently, we've had the integration of Trace Debug, um, which is something that wouldn't have been possible without, again, community assistance. Um, so Stefan's going to be talking uh, much more in the next talk about uh, about the trace debug work. So I won't preempt him there. And we've also historically we've also we've always worked with we tried to find the lowest cost FPGA boards that we fit on. Um, so the Nexus 4 DDR has served as well. We've recently added support for the Nexus video as well to potentially allow slightly larger designs. Um, like Fossey, um, we've been very grateful to be part of uh, the Google Summer of Code again this year. Uh, so we've had uh, four successful projects looking at porting the Arduino library to run on the Pulpino cores, to um, work towards open DDR controllers, uh, trust execution environments, also work towards the um, producing uh, the basis of new teaching materials, such as porting MIT's XD6 teaching operating system to RISC V. Uh, we've also had a uh, you know, really good set of uh, summer interns, local uh, Cambridge students, work with us over summer. And uh, so we, this was, a, this was a, a pretty short project with a group of students who have had, um, well, in one, in one case, they had no, um, int no previous experience with Verilog at all. In the others, they'd done a little bit, maybe a few hours of practical work in, in labs. Uh, so we kind of sat down and thought what we could achieve in this time and also what would be useful for uh, the community at, at large. And so we, we thought, I mean, it's always fun to have, you know, a visual, something visual. So we added a frame buffer. We looked, we, we ended up worked with them to look at adding accelerators for MPEG-2 video decode. Uh, the aim is not so much to produce a, a piece of IP that we might, in, so it, it, the aim wasn't to produce a piece of IP that we'll definitely include in the low-risk SOC. It was more to, and provide an opportunity um, for these students to you know, explore working on a large, uh, or on a, for them, a large hardware project to uh, look at the trade-offs, um, kind of software, hardware, co-design, um, but also hopefully to produce a tutorial that other people can use to add their own custom accelerators. And so I think they've, it, it, the, the project itself was, you might say, a mixed success in that the, it, as always happens with these things, you get to 10 weeks, and then you think if we just had another few weeks, we could achieve so much more. So they produced an, an, awful, an awful lot in that time. I think they've, they've, they've recognized, as they just say in their write-up, they fell foul of a few classic um, pitfalls, and Dow's Law being one of them. Um, so it wasn't quite the speed up um, that you'd hope. Um, but we'll, I'll, I'll shortly be putting that tutorial and all the documentation for that online. Um, I was actually just waiting for me doing tedious website stuff to get the embedded uh, LaTeX working. And so in terms of our current efforts, uh, Wei, um, who unfortunately is an all comp this weekend, he's continuing working on uh, reintegrating tag memory. So we had a previous release um, due to the rapid pace of upstream rocket development. Uh, we kind of, uh, uh, that, that was temporarily removed, but now Wei's been working on 
both re-adding map, but also looking at ways of, re -up, uh, of providing a further optimized tag cache, particularly for cases where programs either have very sparse use of tags or they make almost no use at all. So ways where we can try and uh, increase the reach of a tag cache in those kind of areas. Uh, Jonathan, who's down at the front, who's um, here with me from a lab, he's been working on the initial integration of uh, Pulpino-based minion calls, amongst other things. Uh, and I've been working on um, some LVM work, which I'll talk about uh, briefly in a moment, and uh, various software work to try and help uh, support way with the tag memory. Work, tag memory. And so our, our next milestone is to try and produce a somewhat complete uh, system integrating our main features by Christmas slash for New Year-ish. Um, it's, and I should say, this won't be a completely polished, complete, you know, ready to go and tape out solution. The, uh, the idea is to produce something that integrates in some form our main ideas so that you can go and download it, play with it, and we can iterate from that point forward as we head towards a tape out at some point later in 2017, where we're heading for, a, uh, the aim is to have a 28 nanometer multi-project wafer run. Uh, and so this gives an overview of our kind of the planned low risk SOC design. Um, so we have a current, we, the, our current intent is to fit on um, four rocket cores or potentially two rocket cores and two boom cores, as we'll hear more about boom tomorrow. Uh, we have the tag cache, which you might consider as being, oops, sorry, I'm, there we go. Uh, the, tag, the tag cache you might consider as being kind of logically uh, interposed between uh, main memory and the L2 cache, which serves to kind of stuff the memory requests that come back from memory with the extra metadata. Uh, over here we have the, our um, pulp, uh, our cluster of pulp cores acting as minion cores, initially um, performing I.O., but we're also interested in uh, how you might use them with, integrate them with the trace debug system, for instance. And this is roughly where we are now, but I think we've somewhat further as the, the tagged memory reintegration is actually pretty much done now. Um, so we, we, I think the, with tagged memory basically in place, the next step is to finalize an initial minion core integration, and then we have the base SOC platform from which we can move forwards. Uh, so, to say a little bit about low risk itself, as I said, a lot of the development work is done, has been done at the University of Cambridge. Um, we, at the very start, we incorporated a community interest company, a not-for-profit, to support those, um, to kind of support those activities and handle legals, hold, tra hold the trademarks, all that kind of stuff. Um, we're actually starting to spin up more activity through that vehicle now. Um, I'll shortly be leaving the University of Cambridge and working through low risk CIC full time. I think we'll see more of a split between uh, the kind of developments and support work for going through the CIC versus more uh, you know, standard research focused stuff, as well as some general development work going on at the university. Um, so you know, with low risk, we're very interested in looking across the whole hardware and software stack. There's no point um, being laser focused on just the core SOC because the, you know, any interesting new hardware proposal involves cross-cutting changes across the you know, micro-architectural, architectural work, um, the kernel, uh, the compiler, the user space software stack. Um, and so if you're interested in building RISC-V systems or building uh, systems based on open hardware or further supporting the development of that community, then uh, please talk to me over this weekend. So one of, the, one of the things I've been working on recently is trying to improve the situation with support for uh, Risk Five in LVM. Uh, so I've been uh, working with some other people in the LVM community to try and establish Risk Five as a a reference backend for LVM. I feel that in general, you know, we have all these open source software projects, um, primarily which, although they they do have large corporate backers, but also have masses of contributions from academics and from uh, unpaid volunteers. And I feel that. There's a real opportunity here that you know the best. I see no reason why the best LVM uh, backend in terms of documentation, in terms of accessibility, in terms of ease of getting started, shouldn't be the also be the one that targets the most open ISA. It just seems to make sense. So I'm very interested in positioning Risk Five in that area. It would be. I think it would also be good to look at what we can do with the uh, Linux, QMU, other other parts of the software toolchain. And there's as well as it being 
um, LVM support being immediately useful for us with the tag memory work, um, where uh, certainly we have, uh, both within our research group and me personally, we have much more experience with LVM versus GCC. Um, we also hope that with LVM's dominance in the research community, it will also providing a, a solid, clean backend with clear documentation, substantially more documentation than is currently available, um, will make it much easier for groups who are performing um, architectural explorations and looking at doing hardware software co-design where currently they're very put off doing any compiler work because they just don't have that expertise in-house or it's very difficult to estimate what, what the time would be. And we're also, I think it's, you know, as any of you who maintain an open source project know, whenever you get a, a submission, a pull request or similar, you'll have a, there's a little bit of trepidation in that you wonder, you know, it, it, any, any code you add is a new, main, it's an extra maintenance burden. You wonder what it, you know, yes, it may serve a, a it may grow, the, grow a community, but what, but will it actually help the project as a whole? So I'm interested. So part of the work I've been doing is looking at how we can um, further improve um, the base, uh, base LVM itself. So one example is that where, you know, thanks to help of a, um, a ex very experienced LVM uh, contributor who has um, does um, horrific things with LVM backends targeting DSP architectures, we've been looking at trying to reduce code duplication in LVM backends where uh, currently, so if you're, well, w if you're familiar with RISC V, you have the case where both the 32-bit inst 32 instruction set, the 64-bit instruction set, and the 128-bit instruction set. Um, the instructions are, of course, semantically slightly different, but they all have the same encoding. And uh, unfortunately, LVM has the limitation where for code gen purposes, you have to, um, you have to define all of these instructions multiple times for every bit width that you're targeting. And so we're looking, that's an example of where we're looking to reduce code duplication to make it easier to hack on and easy, easier to maintain. So beyond that, um, this is perhaps looking a little bit further forward. Um, we're, as I say, the, the goal is to try and work towards introducing open source development models to the hardware, uh, to the world of hardware, and to impact and improve things. And the vehicle is um, producing a real SOC, but I think there's also things that we want to do beyond just building something interesting and attracting contributors. And the first one is obviously documentation helps people get started and I think there are clear communities who where there is a um, particularly the you know, researchers or in university education where there aren't that many options they don't have access to uh, commercial IP and they want to work with something real where even a, a comparatively small amount of effort in teaching materials in reducing the friction to getting started could lead to a high payoff over longer term um, I think there's also examples of uh, tooling that would help that helps research groups get started LVM being one of them I'm also very interested in exploring further options for cycle accurate software simulation particularly cycle accurate software simulation validated against a real hardware implementation to help groups provide um, implement uh, more rapid design space explorations and I think once you have that point where you start to have more contributors there's a question about how do you you know, best capitalize on that opportunity? How do you um, ensure that, you know, we have access to expertise, people who are very kindly offering their advice and input? How do you ensure that you have the right structure and level of support that they can, you can, people can form ad hoc collaborations in a productive fashion? And I think part of that is changing the way we design hardware in order to better support open source development strategies, but also looking at whether, um, you know, perhaps a naive tran uh, translation of the open standard open source uh, software development methodologies to hardware, perhaps there are some tweaks we can make that would uh, better suit um, some of the issues we face with hardware. And so, in summary, I've um, hopefully reminded you how, you know, low risk is, our, our aim is to produce, our current aim is to produce this SOC, but actually we're, you know, we, uh, we have long-term goals to you know, work with FOSSI and others in the community to build a vibrant ecosystem around open source hardware in general, where we will hopefully provide a, a useful base platform for people. Um, activities through low risk CIC are starting to rev up, and I've kind of laid bare our not very secret strategy of building something interesting to attract people, uh, to try and um, add extra 
um, to try and find ways of growing contributors to that through, for instance, outreach to universities and researchers to try and adopt the platform. And then looking further forward, looking at ways to better facilitate ad hoc collaborations. Um, as I said before, low risk can't happen without the help of other people. A prime example of that is the trace debug work that Stefan will be talking about, about shortly, which is an example of something that we knew we really wanted to have, but with the resources that we had available, we knew that our core team couldn't implement it on our own. And so thanks to the help of Stefan and his collaborators, we were able to, um, we've been able to produce something that's much better than we could have achieved you know, just on our own. And so, um, as always, look at our website, our mailing list for if sharing ideas. Um, I'm here all weekend, as is my colleague Jonathan, who's sat in the front. Um, so, uh, so if you want to talk about anything low risk related, then just uh, chat to us. Do you have any questions? Uh. <laughs> <clears throat> yep. Come on. Um, I noticed. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed you commented about needing cycle accurate software simulation. Yep. Um, let me commend Verilator for you. It is a wonderful tool for cycle accurate simulation of code within your own design. It also allows you to build um, C++ uh, objects uh, to go ahead and uh, simulate the hardware that you might be interacting with. Yeah, uh, one uh, example of that would be a, a DDR3 controller I put a, built a simulation for. Okay, great. Um, so we, we actually do, we do make heavy use of Verilator already. Um, I suppose I should, uh, perhaps cycle approximate is um, more my area of interest. Um, simulations that would run uh, substantially faster than you can achieve through Verilator, but perhaps, so Gem5 would be one example of a tool in that, various, that kind of field, but I think a, we can, achieve more than is done with current Gem5 backends by, as I say, validating it against a real rocket chip, against a real, um, a real boom chip, uh, or at least a, a simulation of a real chip, so that it actually, uh, you, can, you can have some assurance that the implementation of the, your gem, of the pipeline in Gem5 has some, is at least somewhat similar to a real shipping processor, which unfortunately you, have, you don't have with any current Gem5 backend. In the um, chip you're planning to tape out next year, how much sort of closed third-party IP will be in it? Like the, the, the DDR3 controllers, um, is that third-party IP, or will that be stuff you've developed? Yeah, uh, so that is, so, it, so we're currently in delicate negoti negotiations with a number of potential partners on that, and the, uh, the plan A would be to incorporate third-party uh, memory controller and PHY um, to reduce development costs and development efforts. Um, I mean, philosophically, we'd want to be at a place where we have a, at least down to the RTL, complete open implementation, um, but it's, uh, if we're able, particularly given the experiences we've heard from others who have tried to unpick um, controllers and PHYs that are sold together, we think it, it may add extra risk to the project without a, uh, a substantial initial benefit. So if a third party wanted to kind of um, tape out your SOC, could they buy the same IP? Um, essentially, uh, would you be, then be able to share the design? Or um, are there other barriers to kind of replicating the, the SOC? So that's, that's exactly the model that we would like to achieve. Um, as, as always, it uh, depends on the third parties we're speaking to seeing the opportunity there. I think that it, it would be great to have a system where um, particularly for the, the thighs and the like, where there isn't a, um, well, there are very interesting efforts on open source thighs, but it's going to take some time to develop, um, where a system whereby you have a, a relatively low cost license to, for instance, get access to all of the thigh easily. Uh, that would be ideal. I hope we're able to achieve it. Great. Any other questions? It seems like you have a lot of IP cores in, in the low-risk project. Uh, are you using anything to handle dependencies between the cores or manage them? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Not currently, um, but I've heard of a really good project um, that we should probably start using. It's called FuseSock. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think Olaf, you should go and look it up. You might find it very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I guess that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Cheers.